Welcome to The Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. How are you doing on this foggy summer morning? June swoon. I'm doing terrific, and we have a great guest, and it's going to be interesting, inspiring, and I think you're all going to really enjoy the time. Yes, we recently had the opportunity to interview Dr. Sherilyn Sheets by Zoom, and we're going to show that to you now, and we're going to get right to it. joined today by a leader in the dental profession, Dr. Sherilyn Sheets from Newport Beach, California. She's an internationally known clinician, educator, researcher, author, lecturer, and also a philanthropist, and also the recipient of numerous awards. First, she's past president of the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and the American Association of Women Dentists. So we're really excited to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've really been looking forward to this. Dad, why don't you tell us how you know Sherilyn? Well, I don't know uh, the exact year, but I'm going to be pretty sure it's the early 90s. And uh, I came down and gave a lecture at a group that I think Sherilyn belonged to. It was Carl Reeder's, the uh, Pacific Coast Society of Periodontics or, or prosthodontics. And uh, I was asked to give a lecture. And I remember uh, during the break, I was in the restroom and a guy came in with a bullhorn and he said, it's time to get back in because, you know, Ronald, what are you doing in here? So anyway, I think I might've met Sherilyn there, but by, by 1995, I'd met her for sure in Maui because she was president of the American Association of Aesthetic Dentists. She was a leader in that group. Uh, the group, does, the, our audience doesn't know, but maybe we should say that that's about a hundred of the internationally probably most uh, successful people, the leaders in dentistry. And it's a very prestigious group. And she's been in that group for years, she'll tell us. But anyway, she was present that year and I met her there. And then uh, we had dinner together in the presidential suite, which uh, you got probably comped because the meeting was there. Yes. So that was a big, uh, that was a wonderful experience that night in Maui. And then we've met each other at other meetings in the mountains, uh, in Aspen, and so at lectures and things like that. That's true. I just want to make one clarification, okay, and that I was not in the men's restroom when you met me. <laughs> <laughs> it was only Carl with the bullhorn that was in the restroom. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's start with the early years. How, like, tell us a little bit about your family, where you grew up, and what made you want to get into dentistry? Oh, okay. Um, well, I was born and raised in a town uh, close to the LA International Airport called Inglewood, California. Uh, my mom and dad were very uh, involved in the community, and my uncle Russell Sheets had been a dentist there. He was about 20 years older than my dad, and my dad then followed in his footsteps, and then uh, dad was 30 years older than I was, and so then I followed in his footsteps, um, much to his surprise, and also wanted to be a dentist. So there was over 100 years of Sheets dentistry in the town of Inglewood um, by the time that uncle Russell had retired in his 80s. Dad had retired uh, in his uh, 70s, and, and I had ultimately moved the practice completely down to Newport Beach. So, so did you, were, were they also prosthodontists? No, they were uh, general dentists. And then uh, my mother was, uh, when she was 17 years old, was actually a dental assistant working for Uncle Russell when his younger brother, JB, my dad, came out uh, for a summer. And that's when dad first met my mom and was smitten from that point on. And then uh, I also had an uncle that one of my aunts, my aunt Nadine married uh, Dr. Maury Frankel, who was also a dentist. Uh, and then 
numerous aunts were office managers, uh, dental assistants, and I just was surrounded by dentistry my whole life. So when I was 15, um, I had decided that uh, I wanted to be in dentistry, but I, I wanted to be the dentist. I didn't want to be a hygienist or you know anything else. So uh, that was a little bit of a shock to my dad. I remember we were driving to church one Sunday morning and I said, well, I think I know what I want to be when I grow up. And dad said, oh, really? Well, what's that? And he was thinking it was going to be hygienist and or hoping, you know, because he thought it was a wonderful profession for a woman, which, which it is, you know, for anybody really. And so I said, well, I want to be a dentist. And there was this silence in the car. And I thought, oh, geez, you know, <laughs> I don't know if he's that excited about this. And, and then he said, after a few minutes, he said, oh, well, I think that's a wonderful idea, honey. And then my, my mom, the cheerleader is going, oh, that's great. I'm so pleased, you know, for you. And I think you'll be terrific. It turned out that my dad had a woman in his class at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and she, or the class ahead of him, and she was treated so terribly that he said, I will never allow my wife or a daughter of mine to go to dental school. So that all just came rushing back through his head, you know, oh. when I announced at age 15, you know, I wanted to go to dental school, but um, he realized that he just needed to prepare me, you know, that it might have a few rough sledding moments, but he thought that I was really well suited for it, so. In fact, he was very- I, I know when, oh, I'm sorry. I know when I was little, I told my dad that I wanted to also be an endodontist. And do you remember what you told us, dad? Because Lori, I think said it too. You said, no, you don't. No, you don't. He's, <laughs> he said, too lo the hours are too long. It's just, it's not, you don't want to be an endodontist. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting because um, fast forward when I was a dentist and, you know, had a really busy practice and both my mom and dad who were really hardworking uh, people um, said to me, well, we're really excited you did this, but we didn't really intend for you to have to work this hard. But you know, the, it's, it is a challenging, wonderful profession. And if you really are all into it, uh, you know, you can put in some pretty long hours, but, but I, I'm thrilled I did it. I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I love it. Now, you mentioned when we were talking before we started the interview that you started dental school when you were 19. So how did you manage that? Oh, well, okay. I was, uh, I was young for my grade anyway. So I started college at, at 17. And I, I looked at the book, the, you know, the Barron's book that you had to study in order to take the uh, DAT exam. And it was three inches thick. And yeah. I thought, oh my gosh, I have no idea exactly where to begin with this. So I, I came up with this plan that I was going to take the DAT just for you know trial, and I'd see the areas that I failed, and then I would know those areas that I could study. So that was the plan. So I went in totally relaxed. I walked in with no books. I had two um, number two pencils you were supposed to take, and I had practiced my chalk carving, and that's it. And I went in then to meet with the head of admissions because that's what you had to do then at the dental school to get your scores. And when I sat down with him, I'd already met him once to let him know that I wanted to go to dental school. And so he went through each of the uh, sections of the test for me. And, you know, they were all good. You know, they were fine. And so then I said, well, look, I, I, can, I know I can do better. I mean, shall I study? I mean, the committee, will they want me to do better on it? And he said, no, I think it's okay. And I said, well, are you sure? I mean, I'm willing to, you know, to take this again and try and up my score. He said, no, I think it's okay. Little did I know, he was a one-man admission committee to the dental school. He personally made every choice. So I think he, at that point, he thought, hey, if she can pass it, she's one semester into college, you know, I think she'll, she'll do okay. So I never even got an interview. So I was panicked. I thought, oh my gosh, they didn't even think enough of my application to give me an interview. And so then on Christmas Eve day of my sophomore year of college, a letter finally came from the dental school. I was so thrilled. So I opened it up expecting to, you know, hear about my interview. And in fact, it said, congratulations, you've been accepted to the class of 1968, I guess it was. So anyway, um, I was in. So then at the bottom, there's an asterisk and it says, but you must complete all of the requirements for entry to dental school because I still hadn't taken a lot of the classes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a little different than your story when you had to basically do high school again at age 17. <laughs> well, I didn't think well, the interview was about me. Okay. We all have different pathways to get there, right, Cliff? It was a circuitous route. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice and your partners? Uh, it's a pretty nice location, Newport Beach, and then well, I also see that you just um, what like we also want to know like what kinds of cases you see that kind of thing. Okay, well, um, keep in mind this has been an evolution over many decades, um, but I am absolutely thrilled uh, with the practice that we have, with the team that's there, with my partners who are just exceptionally talented um, dentists, and uh, Dr. Jacine Paquette. And I've been partners for 28 years. Uh, Dr. Jean Wu uh, has been a partner with us now for um, 15, 16 years, something like that. And um, they are both prosthodontists, just seems board certified prosthodontists, they have very interesting stories on their own on how they arrived here. But I started um, my practice in Inglewood and then I started seeing patients also um, uh, at the same time in Newport because we'd had a lot of patients move out of the Inglewood community down to Orange County. And I practiced there with uh, Carl Reeder who was a wonderful mentor to me and then uh, set up my own practice which is where we are now. And so that was originally five operatories about 2000 square feet. I didn't think I would ever have a partner. Ever, people kept saying, you're gonna build this as large as your dad did because that was a 4,000 square foot facility with 10 operatories, I said, and 25 employees. I said, never, I'm never gonna do that. Well, we have over 6,000 square feet. We've got about 28 employees and, um, and a, in a laboratory you know, within the facility, which also is the area for our teaching institute, our nonprofit teaching institute. and. Um, it's, it's, it's such an incredible way to be able to practice because of the combined um, philosophy, you know, that we have as three partners and the ability to be able to purchase the technology, you know, that we want in order to help us practice at this level. And I, Cliff, I mean, you know, for me, it was your encouragement and Dennis Shanelak's um, to try out the microscope for restorative dentistry, which nobody was doing and see if there was any efficacy for using it. And it literally was a game changer. So there were several game changers for me in my career. Certainly the microscope was one of those. And uh, it just also kept this whole thing that I learned from my dad, which was curiosity. And I've always been curious about different things and new technology. And so it kind of feeds on itself. So right now, you know, we're pretty technologically uh, committed, you know, between the microscopes, the digital scanning, uh, the, um, well, I mean, it's, I mean, you name it, whatever's going on digitally, we've got it. So I, I just looked this morning at some data on a patient because you were asking about the types of, of patients that we care for. And we get a lot of referrals of patients from other dentists where it's just too difficult or too complex to handle within their practice. And uh, that's, we, we gladly take those patients because we are set up to really handle them with a team that can take care of also the psychological aspects that sometimes come with a patient that's had a lot of failures in dentistry before. And so we have a full implant surgical suite uh, with both Dr. Paquette and Dr. Wu. We've got the complete uh, prosthodontic restorative capabilities. And then we have the laboratory technician team. We have six technicians that are world-class that only work for us and they're in our operatory. So that's kind of the general overview. Um, and, and then we have a hygiene team of five hygienists that you know, about three a day that keep our maintenance. So the goal is to help each patient achieve their optimal oral health and at the same time teach them how to maintain that so that they don't just destroy it again and then um, move them into maintenance so that from that point on, they don't have that major work that they need again. And then we get some patients that have very minimal needs and they just heard we were a nice dental office and they show up and we're really happy to have them too. I know you're curious because uh, many years ago, I think it's about 95 or so, you came to Santa Barbara and we wanted to share uh, seminar ideas. Right. And I'd been doing this, I don't know, since 83 or something. And of course, you'd already been teaching on the road and stuff. But I think you were thinking about maybe 
starting that Newport Coast Oral Facial Institute. And that I want the audience to know, uh, my other daughter and I and my wife, Phyllis, of 52 years, we came down and saw it when it was still, I don't think Larry Kleinberg from Global was done at that time, but we could see the whole footprint where it was going to go. That's that right. Exciting. And then I wanted the, the group to know, when she talks about an inside lab, you probably are nodding your head, yeah, I've heard of that a lot. But if you're a member of the AED and you're an endodontist, uh, which I was for a while, I was a member, um, I got kicked out because my deficiencies slipped down a little bit and they told me to do remedial work and I could come back. But That's anyway, the true. Point, <laughs> there was world-class people that taught we as dentists, specialists, and they were lab technicians. So I want the audience to know that when she says internal lab, she said they were very highly trained, but these people, um, they're like artists. Absolutely. Um, it is such a privilege and a joy to be able to work with our dental laboratory team. And uh, they are with us in the operatory, you know, we're with them in the lab. Uh, they, their input is invaluable and their artistry, you know, is just untouchable. And, and that's what we need in order to be able to recreate a natural looking dentition uh, for people that don't have that any longer. And it's, uh, you know, just this whole combination of the engineering, the biomechanics, the biology, the aesthetics, um, you know, and how it all comes together and works together is, is really, uh, fun to do. I mean, it's challenging in some situations, obviously, I'm not going to say it's not, but to be able to end up at the end of the road and just see that patient's reaction when they see themselves looking as they had dreamed they could, or maybe even beyond what they dreamed they could, you know, it's just a, a really wonderful feeling for all of us on the, you know, on the team, on the oral health team forum. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your practice philosophy, which I noticed that have actually written out on your website. And you had said that your partners share a similar philosophy as you. And um, I, I just, I, I really like how you emphasize that, that you wanna help people like get a beautiful smile, but then you define beauty as replicating and enhancing nature. So I think that that was really interesting because well, why don't you just explain more about your practice philosophy? Okay, well, um, if you think in terms of what is really beautiful, and, and you're trying to go back to something that looks uh, very natural and, and, and kind of the ideal, you're usually into some proportions, but you're into a whole vibrancy of the tissues, of the teeth, and, and that's what speaks to someone when they're looking at you as being attractive. And so it's a little different than um, the push towards getting whiter, 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 opaque, which oftentimes in the past was, I think, a goal and, and it was thought that that was attractive. And, uh, and it can be, you know, for some people, but really for most people, you want to have that look of vital um, luminescence. And so in a, in a natural dentition, when the light hits it, it gets transferred like a fiber optics rod up into the tissues, which light up and everything is, you know, is looks healthy and attractive. And it's, you're not drawn to it like, oh, you know, they had their teeth done. What you're drawn to is, oh, isn't that an attractive person? And so in order to accomplish that, it has to be healthy. So we always start at the, at the basic foundational level of building structural strength within the teeth and within the tissues of creating health, getting rid of inflammation in the gum tissues, teaching patients about biofilm and how that's been the culprit, you know, in causing their disease breakdown for most people and how to control that. And then when we start actually prepping teeth, it might be, you know, quite a ways down the road. And then we're going into an environment that's been set up so that we can give them the best possible result. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview. Question. Oh, go ahead, Dad. Um, Lisa and I were, I was telling Lisa, uh, ask Sherilyn about the distinction in her mind, if any, between cosmetic dentistry and aesthetic dentistry, because I think I'm pretty clear about it, but I want to be careful because I, 
was looking in Newport Beach and I saw that there was cosmetic dentists and I thought, she's not a cosmetic dentist. She's never been a cosmetic dentist. And well, she lives in the shadow of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, cosmetic dentistry um, certainly, you know, brought uh, an emphasis, you know, on, on aesthetics, which is, you know, is positive. And, uh, but it typically is a term that's used in general dentistry for someone who has an interest in um, veneers and maybe changing a smile and uh, smile design, which also can happen in an aesthetic rehabilitative practice. But one is a general dentistry focus, the other is a prosthodontic uh, specialty focus. And so I kind of grandmothered into the prosthodontic field, uh, thanks to Carl Reeder, and learned the disciplines, which really changed my entire trajectory of my personal practice. Um, and was able to enter that way. Uh, Roy Yanasi, I think you know, Cliff said one time, he goes, you're a dinosaur. He says, because you entered prosthodontics, you know, the, the way where they grandfathered people in. And uh, it was such a wonderful opportunity, you know, for me to practice with Carl, who was renowned internationally at the time, you know, for his prosthodontic work. So, um, but, but it's different. It's different than general dentistry. You have a, a, concept that's more of a systems analyst approach to oral health. So I had to learn to change my initial examination of my patient from something where, you know, you were going in and, and just doing a, a look at what needed to be done restoratively. Mm -hmm. And then you would maybe layer on a, a perio problem that the hygienist was highlighting to you, or, and then maybe they needed endo and I'd send them over to you, Cliff, to, you know, to get that taken care of. But with the prosthodontic approach, you know, you have a very comprehensive examination before you begin anything. And it, our comprehensive exams take about two hours. And so we are going through um, perio, we're doing an oral cancer exam. We then go in with the Velscope to do the more high-tech oral cancer exam. We do an occlusal TMJ examination, which really sets you up because you start to see, well, my goodness, there's a cracked tooth on this side. And when the patient's moving over into lateral going the other direction, they're putting really heavy forces and that's gonna be the next tooth that cracks. And then you um, finally get to the dental part of the examination. And now because, and, and things start to make sense, you immediately already start understanding where ultimately that patient needs to go. So we have uh, a, a chart that allows us to do a five-tier diagnostic system. By that, I mean phase one, you know, is gonna be in this one box and there's actually five boxes going up our, our sheet. And then I can say to my dental assistant, who's uh, acting as a human scribe on this, that box one is gonna be, you know, a composite, but box three is, because I'm really using it as a buildup, is going to be, a porcelain onlay or a porcelain veneer onlay or a, a, maybe a crown would be the next box up in case there wasn't enough structural strength. So it allows you to lay out quickly, not only the immediate needs for that patient that are presenting, but also where you think they need to go long-term. So then that enters the next phase of treatment where they are going to be taught how to clean their mouth, taking care of all emergency needs. If they say, oh, but I'm interested in this one crown here, but you know they need much more work, you can go in and do a provisional crown because we have some laboratory technicians who can make that look really lovely. And that's gonna take care of their emotional need, but not commit them financially to something that would be ill-advised when they actually need more. I'll just say to the audience, uh, Sherilyn's provisionals, the patients beg to never have them removed. <laughs> Because well, I, leave that, they, the provisionals, with this kind of a interdisciplinary treatment approach, she can stabilize people for months or probably a couple years. And I've seen your work, uh, I've seen your lectures, I've seen Winter and all these people, the AED. Uh, they can wear those because they have good mythology and stuff. They can wear them for quite a while and they're still discovering and learning. Yes, it's, it's, it's a wonderful treatment aid you know, to be able to do that and to allow the patient's knowledge base, uh, we call it the dental IQ, you know, to allow that dental IQ to be increased by their constant recalls. We try and bring most of our patient base in every 12 weeks for hygiene appointments. It keeps them healthier. I think our whole practice has healthier periodontally because of this. Mm -hmm. And it also allows us to constantly be educating them on at least an every three month basis. 
So is what I'm, I'm hearing about back to your practice philosophy is that it's not just about going in and getting this one crown fix that you don't like or getting your teeth whiter. It's like a whole a whole person approach to oral health. I'm hearing words like vitality, inner glow, health. Like, so it's more just about treating the whole person and, and so that they can get the beauty that is natural. Yes, I mean, I, th I think that that's very accurate. And if the patient really only has a simple need, fabulous, you know, we'll take care of that and then, you know, make sure that they're on a healthy lifestyle in order to maintain it. Are there a lot of people like that that are already like perfect and they just have one thing they want fixed? <laughs> yeah, there are some, you know, uh, but <laughs> you get some that have had decades of dentistry done by different dentists, different technicians, different times that are on different, um, uh, schedules of wearing down. And so for those types of patients to be able to take a comprehensive approach and try and get everything so that it's um, stable and now has a time clock that's consistent, uh, it oftentimes can take them, you know, throughout their life. Okay, well, let's now move on to um, the, the research you're doing, because my dad actually was particularly interested in that. Why don't you take it a little bit, Dad, and ask Sherilyn what you want to know. It'll take me about 30 minutes to get to the question. <laughs> uh, I first was aware of Sherilyn's work in damage detection in dentistry uh, actually years ago. And she probably doesn't know it, but she does know she published. So I read articles. I didn't call her. And then I saw live lectures a couple times. And the reason this is fascinating to me as an endodontist, because we have uh, horizontal vertical root fractures. Uh, we have coronal fractures. We have fractures that are incomplete into the pulp. So it's a, it sometimes can be called a diagnostic dilemma. And we do transillumination, we have microscopes, we stain, but a lot of teeth are heavily restored. So those are kind of out the window. So I was listening very carefully because what uh, she'll be telling us shortly is we have a, a device that you can bite on parameter, parameter, anyway, it's going to take data. And that data is going to go into a computer. And where I got really fascinated is with this guy named Dennis Kwan from UC Irvine. And her other person she'll talk about is James Earthman. But both are uh, at UCI, which is a prestigious uh, engineering school. And what Kwan does is he, in his artificial intelligence, I got locked in because I got ideas for endo be beyond what Sherilyn was doing, because there's other ways we could use. But by taking thousands and thousands of pieces of data, finally, the machine begins to get trained. And as yeah. the training continues, it can begin to differentiate and make distinctions between different kinds of fractures. So Sherilyn, I think you're sitting on something that is going to change the way we see and practice dentists dentistry, we're going to treatment plan for less surprises, and we're going to make critical decisions uh, because we can make distinctions. Was it this, that, or the other? So could you tell us a little bit about this in your work? Oh, sure. I'm smiling because I'm just so excited that, um, that you captured, you know, all of this uh, and, and that it was so relevant to you because that's something that, you know, we've really felt was critical. So uh, as, a, as a restorative dentist, I think that the challenge for all of us, uh, you know, whether you know, it's in prosthodontics or whether it's in general dentistry or whether it's in endodontics, um, is, to, is to really know what the structural stability is of a, of a tooth or, or an implant. And really, you know, we're always dependent, and this is something that Jim Earthman uh, taught me, in dentistry, everything we have been doing is visually based. And so um, we got connected together uh, because of something I'd noticed in the operatory when it had natural teeth and dental implants, you know, connected together, which was not a good, a good idea. But anyway, when Jim and I wrote, after we wrote our first paper on how to reverse intrusion, he said, we need to come up with a way to prove our hypothesis. So we were looking for some way to measure shock absorption or something you know, like that in the mouth. And there really wasn't anything. So he invented this research unit called the periometer, which lightly taps you know, on the tooth and gives us back some data. And we were just looking at overall mobility. 
what we didn't realize until we got into this more, you know, it's kind of like going down, Alice going down the rabbit hole and then finding more and more things, you know, what we didn't realize was that we were getting multiple kinds of data out of the software that Jim invented. And this other data also showed us movement in a localized way. Now this localized movement really was, because uh, what we do is we pick up micro movement, what it was was pieces that were touching each other, which is cracks. So if you have a restoration that's cracked, which was the first time we realized we could do this, you're gonna pick up on the graph part, which is called an energy return graph, instead of this bell-shaped curve, all of a sudden you've got this little extra blip in it. And so we were going, what is that? And then we realized we could pick up cracks in, you know, in restoration. Well, then as we started doing more and more teeth, because we were originally looking at implants, when we started looking more and more teeth as, quote, controls, we started saying, my goodness, these graphs are all over the place. So then we started focusing on that and found out we were picking up loose restorations, which is a crack between the restoration and the tooth, and we were picking up cracks in teeth. And so there's vertical cracks, there's oblique cracks, there's horizontal cracks. And so then it was like, well, can we really tell the difference? So this, the shape of the graph, this raw data became more and more critical. And then most recently, kind of fast forwarding decades, um, Dennis Kwan, who actually is at um, North Carolina, he's um, a, a emeritus there. Uh, he started getting into what we could do with this data which we thought at the time, gee, we've got a lot of data. And then once we started working with him, we realized we don't have near enough data. A little short on your data. <laughs> exactly, because now with big data, you need thousands and thousands and thousands of sites. So um, we have been for a number of years now then dissecting, well, testing with the periometer so we know what the reading is, uh, and then dissecting the tooth, which is, a, disassembly under the microscope so we can focus and, and record everything that we're finding and then marking that down and then sending it in to them so that they can start seeing uh, how the shapes of the graphs change with different issues and problems. So our goal is uh, because we're already starting to identify different things, the loose crown, you know, what does that look like? Um, and obviously what we want is you know, the vertical crack because the coronal oblique cracks, we can, we can treat restoratively and endodontically, but it's those vertical cracks, you know, that are the real um, problems for all of us. So um, that's what we're looking at. And we're starting, to, we've got a system that uh, Dennis has created with our data acquisition team. We actually now have a data acquisition team of four PhDs, five PhDs that are all working on this now. Whoa. and developing uh, software and algorithms that can um, not only diagnose, but our goal is that we can predict. So we'll be able to test a tooth and say with 95% accuracy, we feel that this is a vertical crack. Or with you know 87% accuracy, we think that it is a coronal crack. And with 90% accuracy, we feel that it's a loose crown because you may have two things going on at once or three things going on at once. And that's part of what's been so complex because in a dentistry, you oftentimes have multiple things going on in one site. You got a, a loose post that's got a crown that's uncemented. And by the way, it's been torquing. And so you've got a vertical crack in the root. So anyway, those are the more sophisticated things we're working on right now. For uh, the audience, Cheryl and I got into a little email, very, very brief, because we're too busy to do this that way. But <laughs> endodontist are plagued with, is the crack coronal apical in its component, or is it apical coronal? And we won't explain all that today, but for us as endodontist, it has something to do with uh, low, occlusal loads versus maybe spreader or plugger loads deep in a root during obturation. Cheryl, and this is thrilling. And... Uh, I guess if you had more of these out in test sites, and then maybe it's for sale, could all these devices uh, send information to a central area where now the data begins to be massive? That is exactly the plan, Cliff. You are just right on target. Um, we are hoping that uh, what we're ready to send in all of our data to the FDA from a five site, six clinician validation study of the work that uh, we had done you know, in our center. 
and uh, the, the results have come back exactly where we wanted them. They're, we're exactly thrilled with this. So we'll be uh, putting everything in with our um, application for this software program that can help us diagnostically and predictively. Uh, and then we have plans that next year we will be releasing the units that can be used in dental offices. And those will have the capability of transferring the data encrypted so that the patients you know, are completely anonymous and protected for HIPAA uh, to the cloud, which will then go into our data acquisition team so that we can start building up this huge amounts of data that we need in order to constantly keep refining our capabilities, our diagnostic capabilities and predictive capabilities. So, so you were we right say, on the uh, Serendipity is when good things happen by accident? Yes, yes, that's exactly true. We've had many of those instances along the way that have uh, gotten us to this point. Uh, there have been times over the decades where I feel like we've got this huge boulder that we're pushing up the uh, mountain, you know, to get through FDA, yeah. all that. But honestly, we have, during the process, uh, just kept refining this and coming up. And when I look at what, where we are today uh, versus when we started this project, it's, it's absolutely thrilling. And how long have you been working on this project? Well, that's the part that most people hear and then they go, oh no. Uh, but I first met uh, Jim Murthman 27 years ago and we just thought we had a little science project and we were gonna you know, write a paper on it. And uh, at first we were just kind of um, going from one experiment to another and he'd say, oh, I've got some students, let's do this. And then we were getting to the point where we realized that I was I was dependent upon this. And if the if the unit broke down, because they were all handmade, I'd be calling the university and say, Jim, you got to get over here right away and fix this, you know, because we've got a patient coming in and we need it. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, we've gone as far as we can. And so I called a good friend, uh, Robert Heyman, who had started a company in dentistry called Discus Dental. And he had just sold the company. And I said, Robert, would you just take a look at this and see if you think we have something that's valuable and if you think what the next steps should be. And so he came down and we went through our whole dog and pony show with him. And at the end he said, I really think that this is a game changer for dentistry and I wanna be a partner with you. And so the three of us have been working on it ever since. That's when will it will be available? We think uh, our, our projected date for release is this next year. So first or second quarter of 21. So you've been using it in your office. You you use it regularly. I use it. I use it constantly. Um, I've and I've been using it in the office for over ten years. Uh, so that really helped build our database. And I I now include it as part of every examination. And every time before I prepare a tooth, I have a new reading on it so that I know what to expect and what to look for as I disassemble the tooth. And, uh, and then I document through the microscope what I'm finding because that way, when we know uh, going forward, uh, we know what that tooth site had as far as damage. You know, it's really funny, particularly in the type of work we do where maybe you have a full mouth now that is after restoration looks like, oh, you have a bunch of perfect teeth. But the reality is they're not all the same. Some are much more um, compromised than others. And so even after we finish, we test all the teeth and let the patient know so they can see where their vulnerable spots are. And that makes them much more compliant with the preventative things that we're doing, wearing a night guard, don't chew ice, don't chew gum, things that overly stress you know, the teeth and the dentition and it allows us to get much more longevity and health out of anything that we do. Okay. Well, Lisa will tell you that every Ruddle show is supposed to do three things. It's supposed to inspire people, it's supposed to make them laugh a little bit, and they're supposed to learn. So I'm saying directly to the audience, this is one of the things that for my whole career, almost 50 years now, has been a diagnostic dilemma. Fractures. You just heard fracture diagnostics and prognostics is better. It's coming. It's coming. I wanted to move on and talk to you a little bit about the Newport Coast Oral Facial Institute, your train is that that's your training center? Yes, it's our uh, nonprofit educational and research center. So we uh, do training uh, for clinicians on how to use the microscope 
Dr. Jean Wu has taken over the um, lead, you know, on all of that training with the faculty. And I just want to give a shout out to our faculty because none of them are compensated for doing this. This is just a labor of love to help um, clinicians see the power of using the microscope, uh, not only for their patients in improving the quality of their personal care, but also in improving the quality of their own personal health because of the ergonomics and sitting up rather than being bent over like all of us had to learn how to do in dental school. So um, that's, that's the educational part. Uh, and then we also have uh, the research component, which you've been hearing about. Is that on this at the same location as your practice? It is actually. Yeah, we're, we have a, over a thousand square feet that is our dental laboratory where all of our technicians are, but all of the um, benches and work areas there are changeable so that when we're doing our courses, we remove all of the dental cases that we're currently working on and then mannequin heads go right in. And so each person's a seat has a microscope, the mannequin head, the high speed hand pieces and everything they would do to create the operatory experience without any of the tension and stress of trying to learn how to do this kind of dentistry on a real life patient. And that was the way that Jacine and I had to learn uh, to use the microscope. You know, they just basically brought them in and here you're doing these complex things and you're trying to learn how to work with the microscope. And I remember Dennis Chanelak said uh, to us one time when we were up in Santa Barbara, he goes, now that you've learned how to do this, you need to figure out how you can teach someone else to do this in a much shorter time period. So that was the focus of our putting together the way that we were gonna teach this microscope course for restorative dentistry. And we broke it down into segments so they could start with just handheld teeth, they, they could move all around, which of course couldn't do in the mouth, and just get used to the spinning burrs, you know, the higher magnification, all the things that are encompassed you know, in working at this kind of a high speed with a, a, a spinning handpiece. And then we move into the mannequins and then we move into mirror work. And so we figured out at the end of the first day, um, some people at the end of the half of the first day, they're still may be a little disoriented, but by the end of the first day, they're feeling pretty comfortable, but it's that sleeping overnight and bringing them back after the neural pathways have been established and having them have that second day that it really locks in. And it was equivalent to about six months of on the job training that we did. Bingo. And then we thought sometimes maybe we should do a third day, but we realized by the third day, everybody was fried. And so it was not that effective. So two days tended to be the best. I wanna say one thing to our audience. I had the first microscope on the West Coast. I wasn't the first in the country. There were some guys in the East Coast, but I never acknowledged Sherilyn publicly, but I, there was no books. I'm, I'm talking about the introduction of the microscope in her practice and mine. When I got my microscope in 87, there were no textbooks, there were no journals, there were no teachers, there was nothing, okay? Right. There was one article by Apotheker in the early 80s that was three pages and it said he uses a microscope. Okay. <laughs> well, when I started using my microscope, there were a lot of indignities. Things yeah. took longer. I struggled, but I could never, ever go back because right. I was doing things I'd never done before. So yeah. how I want to acknowledge Sherilyn, just like your pop, Lisa, had to struggle and learn, she had to take these, because I told Shanlack about it. I brought him over to the office. Global went in there. Well, that's perio. That's a whole different deal. Suturing and stuff. We suture, but still, it's different. Then Sherilyn. You know, we're working on a tooth. We have a rubber dam on. Sherilyn's working from here to here. She's doing quadrant dentistry in your focal field and all that. Anyway, I just really want to acknowledge you because there were no people you could go and train from because you were the first, I imagine, on the whole West Coast for probably in your field. So you've now gone on to train hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people to enjoy the power of vision. And vision is magnification plus lighting. So that's a pioneer right there. Oh, well, um, thanks. Listen, you were the pioneer and we just always so greatly appreciated both Justine and I, the way that you were so supportive and encouraging of us to do this because like for you, it was tough sledding at first, but I remember I had finished my, my first 
experience when I said, okay, I, this, I gotta, I'm going to have to master this somehow. I had finished a porcelain veneer prep and I thought it looked pretty nice. You know, I mean, I would have taken a picture of it and published on it. And then I grabbed the microscope and I pulled it over and I looked through it and I thought, oh, well, there's this tiny little tiny blip here. I bet I'll polish that. So I picked it up for the first time, had the hand piece and realized how I had to slow it down, but how much more control I started having. And I just kind of dinked around, you know, and said, yeah, now that looks like what I thought it did. And I took the microscope away and I looked at it and I thought, this is the best work I've ever done. And that was it. I thought I'm going to have to, going to have to do this. And for Jacine, she came down the hall one time. She says, come here, you've got to see this. And I went, okay. So I went in and there was a five unit um, gold, you know, porcelain bridge that Carl Reeder had done years earlier. And there was a distal um, FERCA involvement that was impossible to see. But with the microscope, the patient tipped back, the mirror, you could see this whole thing. And she could go in, cleaned it out beautifully, placed a little composite repair, and the guy went to the grave with this bridge. So we looked at each other and we said, we need to master this. And that that's what um, really locked us into it. And um, it, having her there, I think also was help. I wasn't isolated, but we were in on a, as a team and both realized how much we had to do. And, uh, and then we're able to lecture together, uh, teach classes together. And uh, it, it was amazing because we never advertised. We never did anything. And all of a sudden you'd have someone from um, you know, Tennessee, and then you'd have someone from Spain and you'd have someone from local and you'd, you'd have these little classes with people from all over the world. But it was, uh, you know, it was an interesting, fun time you know, to kind of get it started. Yeah, to hear you talk about it, it sounds a lot like when my dad talks about it, like just being, you know, on the front lines kind of like of the whole microscope thing. It's, yes. it's interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit, like I heard from my dad when we were setting this all up that you had just finished remodeling your office when all of a sudden COVID-19 hit and did you guys stop seeing patients and did the remodels you made to your office, have they proved to be helpful now? Like what, have you had to change your protocols? Well, I mean, you, you absolutely captured what happened. We had decided uh, towards the end of last year that even though things still looked nice, uh, that in fact, the wear and tear was starting to show on the equipment uh, as far as its functioning. And also some of the cabinetry, once again, the team has been so good about maintaining everything, but the drawers weren't working as well. And we had things that had been designed for water baths that we weren't using anymore. And so we thought, you know what, it's time. So we literally bit the bullet, took out this big loan from Bank of America, gutted out the five main operatories in the front over the Christmas break, because we uh, took two uh, weeks off, put in all new ADEC equipment in all eight operatories. And then once we got back, we would close down uh, the two operatories on different weekends and everything. And then we would get all the cabinetry changed in those final three. So we finished everything the second week in March. And then March 16th, we had to close down. I was here going, oh my gosh, we just went from, you know, normal production, which it's a very busy office, you know, with the three hygienists and three dentists and a, and a treatment coordinator, um, um, oral health educator, all working to nothing. But you still had your note. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So anyway, um, um, I mean, it all, everybody was stunned, but we went immediately into problem solving mode. So um, Jacine and my dental assistant, Brian, became the emergency team and they would go in and handle you know, any emergencies that needed to be done. And we, of course, started with all of the applications for PPP money and EIDL money and you know, got all of that taken out, contacted every single one of our employees, uh, made sure that everybody was financially going to be stable. And then um, we started figuring out what we were going to have to do in order to keep our, our patients and our team and our doctors safe. And so nobody really was saying anything. So we just took the same approach we took during AIDS. 
you know, yeah. during AIDS, I said to everybody, we have to assume every single person has it, every doctor, every staff member, every patient, and you protect for that. And that's when we put in the universal standard of care. So we realized with this, it was more contagious. And so we had to move from universal standard to transmittable standard of care. And so then it was like, all right, what do we need to do in order to accomplish that? And so we had a game plan already by April 13th uh, and Dentistry Today had asked us to share that you know, with their readership. And so we had everything completed and we sent that in. So it meant adding on other layers. So in retrospect, it was a blessing that we had just remodeled the office because we didn't have to worry about equipment or the cabinetry or any of that. But then we, um, we instituted uh, foggers so that we, you know, because the, the hypochlorous acid fog kills off virus within 15 seconds. We have protocols for uh, the rooms that have been changed, the way that we appoint patients. So for instance, the hygiene schedule, hygienists were um, staggered at 15 minutes so that we weren't having patients coming all at once. Uh, we added an extra 10 minutes to every hygiene program in order to take care of all the additional protocols that needed to be put in place charts being covered, uh, everything having disposable uh, wipes or being covered with disposable things. Then a team comes in and wipes down the entire operatory before the next patient comes in. So there's 15 minutes between each patient. And that meant we dropped one patient per day, uh, but able, we were able to then to spread things out and then also stagger lunches for everybody. So then uh, with the doctors, we were trying to see also, you know, how we were going to work that out. And so we just put in 15 minutes between each patient. And for us, I mean, there are days where we have one patient, you know, with the doctor all day that's sedated. So that's a little bit easier uh, in some ways to handle because you have one area that's contaminated. Then we have um, gone to scrubs. Scrubs has been something that I never really embraced because I felt people weren't using them really appropriately to protect um, with sterility because they'd wear them in the office, out of the office, grocery shop in them, you know. <laughs> so, so we've uh, changed and we um, took part of our, our uh, luckily we have a large storage area and we took things out of that and threw out and uh, completely reorganized and created changing stations with all of the PPE in it. So the employees could come in, they could get their scrubs, they could put them on, uh, they, you know, we gave, uh, made training videos on hand washing and, uh, you know, a proper application of all of the things that they needed. So that all had to be taken care of. So by the time we were now at uh, mid-May, we brought full team back, even though we weren't seeing patients full time, in order to be able to try, have trial days with trial days with the hygienists, with the new scheduling, uh, the patients, we've got uh, uh, access to a stairway that was right by our door to go in. We're on the second floor. Uh, for those that didn't want to go through lobbies and elevators, uh, everybody has to wear a mask. We have temperatures taken twice a day on all employees, temperatures taken on patients every time they walk in. And um, it's some fun little things like there's little masks that have the glasses built into them that protects their nose while they're being worked on, isolates to pull um, ISO lights to pull uh, aerosols out and no, no Cavitron for hygiene, only hand scaling. So just all of those kinds of changes had to be put in place. So we started testing that uh, second week in May, June, we went back to see how we could incorporate more, you know, full-time work and that's going well. Uh, and we're hoping by July that we've figured you know, all of the details out and that we're back. So we're probably over 75, maybe 80% right now of what we were before. And, uh, but, you know, you have to always realize we had three months of closure, you know, and there's always things in the pipeline when you're working full time that just stopped, dead stopped. I've never experienced anything like that in my career. And so it's a matter of then just getting the pump primed again and getting back to what you were doing, but everybody feels comfortable. The staff says they feel safe. Uh, they feel safer there than any place else, which is good. And the patients have said the same thing, you know, that they really appreciated the level of care that we've gone. And I, I think that that's maybe certainly dentistry's goal is that we just want everyone to feel that they're in a safe environment because certainly I don't know any other place um, of either medical care or 
um, social interaction that has as many projections in place as dentistry does. Well, maybe Sherilyn, if you agree, we can, in the show notes, we can post uh, your article so that the dentist can benefit from your systems and structures. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, we would love to share that with anybody that could find it useful. Okay. Yeah, because if I was a patient going to your office after everything you just described, I would feel like, wow, they actually have a system in place that I'm going to be fine. I, I feel confident. I mean, I think people want to see, because I've been to another office during this time and the receptionist wasn't wearing a mask and it just seemed like they really didn't have a plan. So yeah. your office sounds like there's definitely protocols in place and I would feel secure going there from what you just described. Well, good. That's exactly the response we want in every patient and staff member. So um, listen, if we can help other people um, put together their plan that's, uh, that's appropriate for their office, you know, we're really happy to help. And okay. the, article, the article has all kinds of um, links they can go to uh, to give them the background that they need. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we also, we did a show on COVID-19, it was called The Way Forward, and we talked a lot about um, Gordon Christensen's, like he had a, quite a clear plan in place yeah. for like how to move forward, so. Yeah. Well, Gordy's fabulous, I mean, it's been a- well, Sherilyn, you know, and Gordon and myself, I, I mean, we're not, as, I guess he's probably a decade older than us, I don't know, but we're up there. <laughs> Definitely, we're on the back nine in golf. What do anyway, you mean? Anyway, he that? talked about AIDS and MERS and SARS and Zika yeah. and H1N1, and we've kind of uh, the older dentists have lived through those eras. Oh, but your your uh, back systems? Did you have to put in any purification uh, systems? Yes, we I, we actually um, I, we purchased twenty one molecule units, uh, and we brought them all over the office. So in each of the operatories, we have two. We have a large one, and we have a small one, which is way overkill. But you know, we're creating aerosols, so that's okay. We don't care. So and and they have um, a boost uh, section, and so uh, there's uh, many different purification systems that are out there. But this one was very stylish looking, and <laughs> with the boost, uh, which you can put on, it's it's a little noisy, but they all are but it really clears the air out. But it, but it screams, we're cleaning. Yes, it does. And we are, you know, so yeah. it's, it's a double positive. Okay, I just want to finish by, uh, I don't, didn't want to skip this, but I want you to tell us a little bit about the children's clinic in Inglewood. Oh, okay. Well, um, as you heard, my family all started there. I was born, you know, just a few blocks away from my family home and my dad had built his dream practice which was right across the street from the home so I practiced there with dad for actually 20 years even though part of that was in Newport and part of it that was in Inglewood and then after he had his stroke it just became really difficult for me to kind of be in both places and we wanted to do something to give back to the community and ultimately what uh, came out of all of that was a children's dental center set up for children of working poor parents, which at that time, 90% uh, had no, uh, no coverage at all in California. So it was just a um, area where someone treated them for free or they went without treatment and most of them went without treatment. So we set it up uh, to be very much patterned after the prosthodontic practice, uh, very heavily uh, oriented towards preventive care uh, and then you know, fixing whatever their problems were, but teaching them how to prevent it in the future and trying to educate the family that um, this was the best economic way that they could deal with uh, oral health for their entire family. So five years after we said, we, we gutted the office uh, that mom and dad had built, uh, we raised a million dollars and rebuilt it into a state-of-the-art center. This is now 30 years ago. Wow. And then uh, five wow. years later, we took the home that mom and dad built that was across the street, and we did the same thing with that and turned it into the Shannon Kelly Tooth Fairy Cottage, which was a educational center for the parents and the children, and uh, had the, you know, Dr. Hygiene's, you know, laboratory, and we had the kitchen, uh, which was Aunt Dottie's kitchen, that was my mom's nickname, and uh, which nobody ever understood because her name was Muriel. And then we uh, had, um, you know, all kinds of setups, but it was, it was very homey uh, and it just allowed them to bring kids over from schools and uh, get education. So we would have busloads of kids coming. So- Are your parents alive? 
my both my parents now are deceased. Okay, I was wondering they, if they, they were homeless. They, huh? No, they're not well, homeless. You took the practice. You took the house. <laughs> yeah. At that time, they were now living in Newport Beach, <laughs> close to us, uh, so we could handle their medical problems. Yeah. No, we kicked them out on the curb and said, "Sorry, we have a higher use for your home." <laughs> but uh, Dad, at the time this all happened, had had a pretty devastating stroke. But uh, for him to see and for her to see that this was given another life that could help people, you know, was was really great. So um, I'm, not, I'm not on the board any longer, um, but of course we're still interested and want to see this successful, but just got photographs uh, from Dr. Uh, Dennis Young, Dr. Dennis Young, who is the CEO for the center. And they just uh, repainted everything. When we did our, our uh, remodel of the office, we, Patterson was just an incredible gift, took all of our ADEC equipment, refurbished everything, and put it all in the Children's Dental Center. Oh. So it's like they've got, you know, new equipment again, because they were really in need of, of an upgrade. And then um, the UCLA dental students have been providing a lot of the care. So even though I originally had SC, UCLA, and Loma Linda that were coming in yeah. and contributing care, it's now predominantly UCLA. So Dennis had everything painted blue and yellow <laughs> in the operatories. And then- No more Trojans. Right, but he is from SC. So he said he took his private office and painted it purple and gold. <laughs> so uh, we are hoping that we can get up to see you know, what they've done. So uh, they always can use help. So if anybody wants to make a donation to the Children's Dental Center, which they are now changing the name to, um, the community dental center, I think, because they realized that with the changes in insurance, even though it's all you know at a lower pay, um, that some of the children you know have options. But if they treat the whole family, they get a better result. So they're taking care of some of the parents and the children at the same time now. Question. Yeah. Lizette is a ferocious Laker fan, and you keep saying Inglewood, and I can't help but think about the forum. Yes. So have you ever gone to a game and did you live in the presence of the, that was a state of the art building, still is. Yes, yes. Um, actually that is six blocks away from the Children's Dental Center. And we are, when you look down Buckthorn Street, the, the Children's Dental Center is at the corner of Buckthorn and Larch, actually in a residential area. Dad had to get a one-time zoning variance in order to build the dental practice there. And when you look down the street, you look straight at the new football facility that is the- Whoa! I mean, you see it just, you know, kind of being uh, developed. Up from right the there. ashes. Up from the ashes, up from the ashes. Oh, it's, it's a stat. Anybody that's flying into LAX, I mean, it's right on the glide path. Well, you were flying right over my home <laughs> because we ended up under the flight pattern. Well, okay. I think that's about all we have time for, Dad. But did you want to ask Sherilyn anything else? I have actually one question. Go, go ahead. So if you could just get, what advice would you give to young female dental stu students right now? I think um, the advice that I would give them is to realize that they are so lucky to have chosen a profession that will allow a female to go to whatever heights they want to go to that you do not have to have a glass ceiling, that you can choose your own way. And I know right now, uh, based upon what people have, have shared with me, that a lot of the message that dental students are getting today is that you need to just go into corporate dentistry and that uh, private practice is something in the past and that it can't be that successful. And, and for women, that it's, it's uh, impossible to really have a family life and then also have a career. And I just want to tell you, there's three of us women who do work hard. You know, you have to make that decision that you want to, um, you know, have a career, not a job. And if you do, you have unlimited possibilities still today uh, in a field that is so needed and so gratifying. And I would say, you know, choose what you want and then just work towards it. Do you have I guess else? my final statement would be something uh, to play off of Sherilyn. Uh, for all the audience out there, uh, guys and gals alike, um, you can see she was a practitioner and she loved it and she was passionate. So that kind of reminds me of, of myself. But for those out there, 
she's way more than a dentist. Dentist, she, you know, she's an entrepreneur, and one of her enterprises is dentistry. But she wove in the publications. But when she's publishing, it's helping her in her practice. So I'm talking about the synergism. When she started inventing because she had curiosity, because clinically she was being challenged by fractures of different kinds, she went after it. And all of a sudden she's publishing, she's inventing. So then there's a children's clinic. So I want to encourage everybody out there. You don't have to be, God didn't put you on this earth to sit chair side in four walls your whole life. You can do a lot. And I'm really proud of Sherilyn. She's a fabulous clinician. And whether she's a woman or a man, I just found my new dentist. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for joining us because I actually feel really lucky to have met you and, and to be able to ask you these questions. I mean, it's a great interview. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I mean, this was really fun and I have loved your dad for many years and just admired so much all that he's contributed to dentistry and, and also your family and your family unit. It just reminds me so much of the love that we have within our family too. And I think that that is, um, is really something to treasure for all of us. So it, this has been fun. Thank you for asking me to do it. Thank you, Sherilyn. Well, that was an informative interview and a lot of fun too. Absolutely. I think we just barely got a little glimpse of a really, really remarkably great dentist. In fact, that was a great example of how to create success by design. We originally planned to have our segment, What Phyllis Thinks, now but the interview ran a little long and we didn't want to cut any of it because we loved it so much so we're moving what phyllis thinks to our next show so see you next time on the ruddle show